Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of The Full Life. Today we're talking about a buzzword that has come into the lexicon a whole lot in the last maybe four to six years. We're talking about Christian nationalism. What is it and what should we be concerned about or not? We'll talk about all of that today. Different Christian perspectives coming together to have important conversations about our faith and help you live in the fullness of life God wants for you each and every day. This is The Full Life with Joseph Mancuso, Carolyn Pankella, Hank Johnson, and special guest host, Tina Webb. The conversation starts now. Welcome back to another episode of The Full Life. We are always happy to see you and have you join us. Of course, if you haven't been with us before, we want to explain what this show is. This show is the place where Christians from different denominations, ages, genders, races, and everything in between come together to discuss our faith, to refine our faith, and deal with issues of faith and culture. And today will be no different. Certainly, I have heard in many Christian circles over the last couple years now, that term Christian nationalism. And today we have a wonderful guest that will talk us through all of what that means, what we should be thinking about when we approach our faith with regard to our politics. But of course, before we get to that, we always like to start with an encouraging word and today's will come from Tina. So thanks, Joseph. Today's encouraging word is that God is always available. He never holds a sign in front of us saying, not in service or come back later. I think about Psalm 46, verse 1. It says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. You remember the story, Moses, and he was growing weak. And in his weakness, he needed strength. And God provided faithful companions to lift up his arms so he could finish his mission. God provides strengthening for us, either directly through himself or through the people around us who love and care for us. Um, we can send a text to a friend at any given moment and say, pray for me, I need prayer. And we can know that they will. I think there are so many troubles in life that so many people are facing right now. You know, children struggling with anxiety and depression, that's a big thing. So much stuff happening in the world and there's so much suffering that we're hearing about. And God is whispering in all of that, I'm right here. He's present. He's a help. He's our refuge. He's available. And he's willing to help. And, and that's just something that we need to just hold on to every day through every moment that he is there and he is always available for us. Well, and with that encouragement, we are going right into our discussion today. And it is, as we said, about the topic of Christian nationalism. So I wanted to ask you guys, as we get into this topic, you know, what is your relationship with the country and how you approach this uh, idea of national, maybe national pride, patri patriotism? I know it's all different, and our guests will explain those terms and the distinctions to us later, but just how you approach that. I mean, and I wanted to go first quickly today in saying that I I would say that I had a very, uh, like I remember 4th of July growing up. I mean, and I really liked the 4th of July and I loved this idea of celebrating the idea of what America was and the freedoms that America brought to people. Um, and and that was, it, it and it filled me with, I guess pride is the right word, but it filled me with an appreciation and a, and a really like, I'm, I feel very privileged mm -hmm. to be in this country, I will say. Mm -hmm. um, having grown up and now learning the history and really living the history of, and, and, and understanding where we might have fallen along the way, it hasn't diminished what I believe this country, uh, what, in this experiment of this country or what I think that that potential could be. But certainly I have seen it as a full picture now and I'm aware that my experience is not everyone's experience in the country now. And, and I think that's a richer and fuller experience too. Yeah, um, I think Christian nationalism is something that is, um, I mean, I, the easiest way for me to put it is idolatry, right? Because I think that as Christians, we belong to Jesus, we belong to each other, and our citizenship is in heaven. So that is actually born for me by two major strands. One is my Anabaptism, which is a, a tradition of Christians who, after Luther's Reformation, thought we didn't go far enough. Sorry, Joseph. Um, so we were called the radical reformers, right? So there's a lot of things that I think most Christians take for granted. Um, one of them would be separation of church and state. 
Um, another one would be believers baptism. And these are things that, you know, the, the ancestors, spiritual ancestors, mothers and fathers, um, or Anabaptism died for, you know, and the things that now Christians consider pretty normal. Um, so I think there's a there's a there's a nice theological strand in that from me. The other theological strand and practical strand is I was also raised in the Black Church, which I think you can argue that especially before the 21st century, um, Black Christians were were one of the groups of people who actually believed in America, who believed in all people are created equal, even though they didn't see it, they didn't live it, they didn't experience it. Um, so when it comes to this idea of Christian nationalism, I, I am both a child uh, of those traditions, right? That, that calls us to say, but what does it mean to, to be proud to be an American? but to know my citizenship is in heaven? What does it mean to, to not say that like, even the privileges I enjoy in this country is not due to the altruistic nature of America as much as it is to my good God? And I think that's the, the danger we run here as Christians sometimes is that when our Americanism supersedes our Christianity, right? I really like that, Hank. That, that, was, that was really good, you know, because I, you know, I think most of us here have traveled outside of this country. Mm. I've been to third world countries. I know many, I mean, I've got the pleasure to work over in Cuba and Haiti mm. and India and these places that do not have the same yes. blessings and freedoms that we have in this country. I mean, we have a country that you can be Christian, you can be Muslim, you can be Catholic. In some countries, you can't do that. I mean, look mm -hmm. at China. They're still hiding their faith. Mm because it's not legal. And so for me, am I a patriot? Do I appreciate the freedoms that we have in this country? Always, every time we land back in America, even though I love these other countries, I, I just touch the ground and I just can feel the freedoms that we have and that men fought and died for. And I appreciate that also. I, I just, I appreciate America. I celebrate America. And I, I'm so grateful that we live in this country. But I, I agree. I'm looking forward to this conversation today uh, just to see how we can balance all of that out with our walk with Christ and still be loyal, first of all, to his kingdom. Amen. Well, then let's get into it now. Paul D. Miller is a professor of the practice of international affairs at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service and co-chair of the Global Politics and Security Concentration. He spent a decade in public service as director for Afghanistan and Pakistan on the National Security Council staff and intelligence analyst for the Central Intelligence Agency and a military intelligence officer in the U.S. Army. Wow. Miller's writing has appeared in mm -hmm. Foreign Affairs, The Dispatch, The Washington Post, Providence Magazine, Mere Orthodoxy, The Gospel Coalition, Foreign Policy, mm -hmm. and elsewhere. So I believe that he's very qualified to talk about it today, and he's going to talk about his new book, which is all about this. So please welcome Paul Miller. Uh, thanks so much for having me on the show and letting me join the conversation. I appreciate it. Oh, Are we well, supposed yeah. to salute? No. Yeah, hey, Paul. <laughs> Not yeah. at all. Not at all. It's awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you for everything yeah. you've done for this, for this country, mm -hmm. and, and yes. thank you for this new book. Um, I believe it's called The Religion of American Greatness. That's, that is the book. And it is all about this concept of Christian nationalism. But in the book, you talk about your history and what you bring in your experience. We've talked a little bit about that in that bio, but you talk more about your faith and where, how you've come to understand this. So let's start there. Let's, let's learn a little bit more about you and how you've come um, to your service and to this topic. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. Um, as I share in the book, I'm happy to describe myself as a patriot. I love this country. I'm a veteran, uh, served in the military and in the government for a decade. Um, I'm a Christian. I've been going to Baptist and non-denominational churches throughout my life. And I uh, will even describe myself as um, conservative, although there's a longer conversation about what that means exactly. Um, maybe it's best to call myself a theological traditionalist. Uh, and was kind of politically right of center until more recently. Um, and uh, again, maybe a further conversation there. And that's kind of where I started with uh, about six, seven years ago, kind of looked around and realized I didn't really understand the political right anymore. Uh, I had grown up in it, uh, kind of proud, you know, card carrying member of the Christian right. And I still to this day admire many of the things the Christian right stood for and fought for and, and, and accomplished but it started to feel like I just didn't quite understand. So I wanted to spend a long time reading more about American history, American ideals, 
and uh, American politics to kind of understand where this came from. It's where I stumbled across this idea of nationalism. And, uh, and, and, and so the book is about American nationalism, which I discovered is always covered or coded in the rhetoric of Christianity, the rhetoric and the symbols mm -hmm. and uh, the values and, um, of Christianity. And so that's where Christian nationalism comes from. You also define some terms in the beginning of the book that are helpful in understanding what your arguments are. And I, I'm excited about this. Those include what you call the liberal democracy and republicanism of our government in this American experiment. And then most importantly, the definition of patriotism and nationalism. And really, I think this is going to be interesting because most people don't even know the difference. And I would love to hear what you think the difference between those two things are. Sure. Yeah, the difference mm -hmm. between patriotism and nationalism. Mm -hmm. and to be clear, it's not a distinction that I made up. Uh, this is pretty conventional. Mm -hmm. George Orwell wrote a famous essay on this in the yeah. 1940s, I think. So I'm kind of pulling from what others have said. Um, I'm happy to say that patriotism is simply loving your home, your country, where you're from. Uh, C.S. Lewis has this great bit in his book on the four loves about how it's very natural and good for us to have an affection for what is familiar, for where we come from, for, uh, and, and pulling from another guy now, Nigel Bigger, for the, uh, the forms, uh, the institutions that have inducted us into forms of human flourishing. It's good for us to have an attitude of gratitude and gratefulness for where we come from. Mm -hmm. That doesn't say anything about how we define our country. And that's what nationalism is. Nationalism is an argument about how we define what it means to be an American uh, or whatever other country you're, you're talking about. Okay. So if you ask somebody, what does it mean to be an American? Um, you know, you or I might say, well, it has to do with uh, the creed, the Constitution, the Declaration, equality, liberty. Uh, I would like to throw in something as well about American history. But if you ask a nationalist, what does it mean to be an American? They're going to answer first by talking about American culture rather than Amer the American creed. And they'll say, well, we are the people defined by, uh, uh, by, the, by an Anglo-Protestant cultural heritage. That's Samuel Huntington's phrase, by the way, Anglo-Protestant. More conventionally, people will say, we are a Christian nation. We're defined by our cultural uh, allegiance to the forms, the habits, the norms, the symbols of Christianity. And that's defined America since the beginning, and therefore we need to stay that way. It, by the way, if you're just talking history, it's absolutely true that Christianity has been the most influential religion in our history. No, no, no debate there. But the nationalist will say, since that was true in the past, we must keep it in the future. And here's the really crucial part. We have to use the government to keep it that way. We actually have to make it the point of public policy, laws and policies to sustain and enforce a Christian cultural heritage. Because if we don't, this is the nationalist speaking, if we don't, we're no longer truly America and we might lose our experiment in free government. In some sense, our Christian cultural heritage is the essential precondition of democracy and, and, our, and our rights. Where we really found it on Judeo-Christian values, is that true? But then um, I think you kind of started answering that. So maybe focus on how did Christian nationalism, as we know it, develop in America? I think sometimes um, among nationalists, there's a, a narrative that we were once fully Christian, and then there's been this kind of continuous decline and fall. And I don't think that's a very good history of America. I think the record's always been really mixed obviously true that a super majority of Americans have been professing Christians. And you can kind of see some consonance between Christian ideals or principles and some of the elements of the founding. You know, I could, I could look at the uh, checks and balances and I, and I could say, that's actually a really wise principle considering what we know as Christians about original sin. Since we're sinful, we shouldn't concentrate power in any one person or even any one institution, right? So checks and balances, like there's a Christian wisdom behind that, I would say. And, and, I, and there's more things that we could say. But of course, we also know at the time of the founding, there was many unchristian, even anti-Christian things like slavery. Um, and throughout American history, there's been other forms of uh, public sin and tyranny and oppression, how the United States treated Native Americans, how the United States treated Roman Catholics it was actually deeply oppressive. And I would say unchristian for quite a long time. And, and so in some respects, we're actually becoming more Christian 
as the decades go on. Now, once again, I can, the record is always mixed. There's many ways in which our culture is more hostile to traditional forms of Christianity today. I'm not going to dispute that. At the same time, let's recognize and celebrate that our country has become more just, more tolerant uh, in, as, as the decades go by. And that's a good thing. I, I think maybe some people will tell you that it's recent and it started you know, just six years ago or maybe 20 years ago or maybe 50 years ago with the Christian right. I, I'm telling you, when I was doing the research for this, I found a recruiting pamphlet aimed at English uh, settlers, English colonists in 1617 that said, come to the new world and build God's temple, right? So in a sense, the settlers, all the Europeans who came to the new world, they, they understood that they were carrying out a religious project. It's been there since the very beginning of European settlement in the new world. It's always been understood in religious terms. You can look back at the debates in uh, colonial Massachusetts between John Cotton and Roger Williams, again, 1630s, 1640s, where John Cotton is saying, Massachusetts is a Christian commonwealth. And if you don't agree with that, we will punish you. We will exile you. Or if you're a witch, we'll execute you. If you're a dissident or a heretic, right? They, were, they had no qualms about using the power of the sword against anyone who disagreed with that conception of the colonial project. I would say that uh, America and the colonial predecessors has always had both strands. One, a creedal understanding where we all stand, you know, we're defined by freedom and equality. And the other strand says, no, we are defined by Christianity and you better get in line. Is there a reason that we are seeing it sort of spike now? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, the United States is not the only country that has experienced a resurgence of nationalism in the last 10, 15 years. So there are kind of broader structural global things going on. And the 2008 financial crisis caused a lot of economic anxiety and, and dislocation. That always leads people to kind of retrench and reassert traditional identities. Um, demographic change has been going on in the United States and in the developed world for decades and decades. And white Christians in America are a smaller portion of the population than they've ever been in all of American history. That, again, will naturally lead to a, a kind of a defensiveness as, as that population kind of maybe closes ranks, so to speak, and tries to reassert traditional notions of identity. Uh, I actually think that the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have something to do with this because they didn't go too well, too well. just to be blunt. We lost both wars. And I actually think that losing a war is sort of, in a way, psychologically traumatic at a national scale. And those who are most invested in American identity, when you see America lose a war, again, the, the, the instinct is to be defensive and to try to reassert our national greatness. You just can't tell the story without Donald Trump. V Victory has a thousand fathers. When he won in 2016, it suddenly became very fashionable intellectually to have something to say about national identity and nationalism and, and what makes America great. Our founding fathers like you, I don't know whether they were Christian. I know that they go back. You have deciding things of whether people say they were Christian or whether they were really not. You know, I, I would love to hear you talk about that a little bit more because they say they were Christians, but then who were they really serving? What was it really all about? You know, there's all that up in the air. Because to me, that's that's the difference. You know, I really don't think America is all upset because of, oh, it's my America. I think it's our morals and our values that people see that are leaving. And, and I have to tell you, it's people that we had a lady on not too long ago that she deals with people who are atheist and they feel the same way we do. It's not about being Christian or being, it's about morals and values. And when you start seeing those delete, depleting it brings something up in people to rise up and stand for those morals and values, which I think that's what a patriot is all about. I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah. So you asked a little bit about the founders. Um, here, I'm going to kind of punt and say there's really good historians who have written good books on this. Uh, John Wilsey, John Fia, Thomas Kidd, George Marsden. They've all written very good books of American history with attention to America's religious history. So if you want to know more about specific founders, those are so, and Mark David Hall would be another one. Um, they all have written very good books on that. For my money, I think there's some 
some of the founders, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, who pretty clearly repudiated traditional Christianity. They were deists who did not believe in the divinity of Jesus. Um, most of the rest would have probably professed something closer to historic Orthodox Christianity. Uh, they certainly would have called themselves that. Christianity was kind of the version of political correctness back then. You sort of had to pay lip service to it. But I don't think that means necessarily that they were insincere. Some of them, I, I want to say Roger Sherman was one of them, were very clearly evangelical and, and orthodox and sincere in their beliefs. Uh, and then some like John Adams seemed to gravitate over his life from more orthodox congregationalism to something closer to Unitarianism, which may not be very orthodox. So it depends. There's a lot of difference. Christianity was in the air. It defined the atmosphere. It was definitely the ordering principle of public life back then. Now, your, your other question, I think what you're asking, and tell me if I'm interpreting this right, um, how can we avoid the dangers of Christian nationalism while still you know, fighting for what's right, defending, defending our values that we care about? Yeah, I think that's a fair question. And I want to make sure that I say this very clearly. I'm a Christian, and I'm politically involved. And I think all Christians should be politically involved. When we're politically involved, we should be advocating for equal justice for all. Uh, we should be advocating for human dignity, for ordered liberty. We should not be advocating for our own privileges or our own perks. Uh, and that, I fear, is sometimes at the heart of Christian nationalism. So it seeks Christian power more than Christian principle. Uh, it seeks political victory more than... Uh, more than uh, a political uh, principle. It, sometimes the difference really just shows up in, in your heart motive, right? I can make a good case. I'm, I'm pro-life. I can make a good case for the pro-life cause or for religious freedom. And I can make that case from a very principled patriotic uh, ground. I can also see how Christian nationalists will sometimes come along and make a, come to the same conclusion, but from a very different, uh, a very different foundation. Uh, and, Sometimes the difference shows up in, in the details. You know, ask someone, do you believe in religious freedom for everyone? Right? Is your concern about the football coach praying after the game, that recent Supreme Court case? And if you're going to defend his religious freedom, will you also defend the religious freedom of a Muslim to say the same prayer? And if and if the person you're speaking to, you know, if they say yes, that's great. That's a, that's a principled uh, position. Um, but I, I've heard some people argue that we should not, uh, we should change zoning laws to not allow the construction of mosques, right? That's, I think, wrong. That is, that's a version of Christian nationalism that is, um, uh, does not extend full citizenship rights to our, our, our Muslim fellow Americans. Um, so that's kind of the, the test I would offer to tell the difference between principled Christian political engagement and Christian nationalism. But yeah, I was going to ask specifically about the pitfalls of Christian nationalism. You know, I think in the book you highlight several of these pitfalls in the political ideology and outlook. I think you started um, kind of talking about that in your last answer, but I guess maybe zone in on, are these really motivated by tribalism and how can that be detrimental? But there's, I lump them in two, two broad buckets. The first is, uh, it's more of a political problem. It's a problem with government and how it uh, operates. And the second is a theological problem and the implications for the church and for uh, how we think about uh, our obligations as Christians. So with that first bucket, um, I just think nationalism is impractical, right? Nationalism of any kind, it requires us to believe that our government can regulate our culture in order to sustain and keep up whatever traditional culture we are advocating. Now, as an old fashioned conservative, I just don't think government does a very good job of doing that kind of thing, right? Government can barely deliver the mail, so I'm not gonna trust it to engineer my culture. Um, I also kind of think that it's sort of oppressive or illiberal in principle to give the government that kind of, that kind of power. I believe in free culture. And I think if the government comes around and says, here's what our culture is, you ought to conform to this culture, I tell you what, there's always cultural minorities and cultural dissidents, and you're kind of treating them as second-class citizens if you hold up some kind of official template of culture at the point of the sword, at the point of a government coercion, and say that you're supposed to be that. Look, we've all heard people uh, in, in, in red states say, we're the real Americans. Just think for a moment about what that says about 
people who aren't there? Is it, are, they, are they somehow fake? Are they second class Americans? I just don't like the implication of that. So I think it's an uncharitable way of thinking about our fellow citizenship with other Americans. Um, so that's the first bucket of problems. There, there's more to, that we could say there, but I, I really wanna pay attention to that second bucket. I think that Christian nationalism is also dangerous for Christians and it's dangerous for the church. Um, I think in a sense, it, it misrepresents the point of Christianity, right? When I think about Christianity, I don't think the resurrection of Christendom is the point of Christianity, right? Christendom, a social order in which, which gives preeminence to the church and to Christian values. That's not really why Jesus came. He came to redeem a people for himself and to inaugurate his kingdom. I look forward to his kingdom, but I know that we're not going to build it here, and I know that America isn't that kingdom. And so it's very important for us to keep that, that difference. Um, I do think the gospel has political implications, uh, uh, but, but our Christian political activism, again, as I've said before, should be aimed at, at equal justice for all, not at resurrecting Christian social power. But as a Christian, I want to jealously guard the church's prerogatives to be the keepers of the keys of the kingdom. What I mean is we get to teach in the name of Jesus. We get to represent God's glory to the, to the nations. Um, and we, we should jealously guard that and not allow the state to take it over. I'm, I'm worried that, I mean, history pretty plainly shows that uh, when you have a very close relationship between church and state, when you have a Christian nationalist establishment, the state kind of takes over and begins to use religion as just a kind of a propaganda, as a, as a cheerleader or handmaiden of the state. Uh, the church needs to maintain some independence so that the, the church can actually critique the state when it goes wrong. Um, but I think for a lot of Christians, they see this nationalism as positive, right? We're making things more Christian. But another metric for me about what does it mean to be a Christian is, does it look like Jesus? You know, so even right. I think part of the critique on America being a Christian nation or part of the critique today in some of the decisions we're making as a government is, does it look like the kingdom? Is it encouraging people to follow Jesus? Uh, Carolyn brought up morality before, and I wanted to talk about a concept that you talked about in the book where you talked about sort of cultural versus uh, versus moral uh, neutrality and how and what the differences of those two are and how those function differently in a, de a democracy or a republic, so to speak. You're, you're picking on the I think the I think the hardest part of the book, um, chapter five, was probably the most difficult to write uh, intellectually. And it's got so many fine distinctions because a lot of the work I do there borrows conclusions from a book I haven't written yet, <laughs> um, which is, is two books from now. What I say in the book is that I, I affirm that we should not be morally neutral. Uh, the Bible plainly says righteousness exalteth a nation. Uh, and we should advocate for what is right. Romans 13, where he says the, um, uh, the, the, the ruler is a, a God's avenger to punish the wrongdoer. Um, so yeah, there's, there should be some moral grounding to government. What I try to, the distinction I try to draw is that um, while we should seek to govern righteously in a democracy, uh, our understanding and our culturally embodied form of righteousness, we should allow that to, to change as our culture changes. I don't think there's any one final form of uh, moral culture that is fixed for all time. Our cultures always change. Every culture is human and therefore fallen. And therefore every culture has its flaws. I think I can also affirm that every culture has some things that are good about it. Uh, and we should never mistake our particular culture, even if it has a Christian heritage to it, we should never mistake our particular culture as the final embodied form of true righteousness. It's an incredibly dangerous place to be. So what that means is, we might be accustomed, habituated to a certain uh, cultural embodiment of our, of our legal understandings of right and wrong. But we should hold that a little bit loosely and allow it to change over time because we might actually, as we have in American history, come to a better understanding of justice and change ourselves to become more just, even if that means changing our culture. Um, again, as America has done, we have changed our culture on purpose to get rid of segregation, for example. That's a good thing that required pretty massive change in American culture to make ourselves more just. But I think for a lot of people who um, would identify as Christian nationalists, a lot of people who would identify as 
you know, looking out for America's best interest because that's the best to the world. They kind of link it to Israel. So they'll take scripture and look at the Old Testament as how um, Israel is the chosen nation. And a lot of people may not even have the theology full or, or may be able to verbalize it, but they really do believe that America is um, the chosen nation. Um, so I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about that, either a breakdown of where that comes from or why that is so dangerous. I'm sure that either you or some listeners at some point saw somewhere a reference to 2 Chronicles 7.14 or Psalm 33.12, right? Uh, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, or the Second Chronicles verse is, uh, if my people who are called by my name repent, I will bless their land. Um, and apply these verses to America as if we are the people called by God's name, as if we are the nation whose God is the Lord. And I think that we, talking amongst ourselves, know that that is a uh, misuse of scripture. It's a misapplication. It's bad hermeneutics. Uh, and it's, it's, it's you know, borderline heretical and politically dangerous. But it's actually wildly popular in quite a lot of the country to use that kind of rhetoric to talk about America. And it was, it, it, it's not recent. Uh, I, I traced references uh, to those verses as applied to America all the way back to the Civil War, for all I know, it even came earlier than that. Americans have been talking about ourselves in this way for, for centuries. In the 17th and 18th century, it was routine to talk about America as the new Israel, the new Israel, in some sense, um, in a covenant with God to do some special work of his on earth. Uh, and now we call ourselves a Christian nation and we cite Second Chronicles 7.14. Ronald Reagan made it very popular. He cited that verse a half dozen times. Um, and you can look at citations to that verse. They, they soar after 1980. It's dangerous because I think it can lead to a sense of national self-righteousness. If you believe that we're in a covenant with God, um, you know, there's a way of saying that which holds us under greater scrutiny because we're accountable to God for our actions and our sins. And that can be actually helpful. But most often you hear it used in a different way uh, to feed a sense that we are special we are God's agents, uh, and look at us, we are so high and mighty. I've always heard that interpreted, it's because we stood with Israel, is that we had the blessing from God. Uh, I, I wrote uh, an article on this some time ago about why America supports modern day Israel. And it has to do with um, a certain reading of the Bible, a dispensationalist reading of the Bible that sees modern Israel as carrying the promises that God gave to Abraham uh, in, in the book of Genesis. In church history, that's a minority view. Most uh, theologians have not see, read the Bible that way. It really started about two centuries ago um, with the rise of dispensationalism, which is actually quite popular in the United States. Most non-denominational churches and many Baptist churches are dispensationalist. And so they see modern day Israel as the carrier of the promises given to Abraham. And God says very clearly to Abraham in Genesis, I think, 12, uh, I, will, I will favor those who favor you. Um, and so today, Americans, some Americans say, well, that applies to us. We should be friends to modern day Israel so that we're on the side of Israel and thus the side of God. I, I don't read the Bible that way. I'm not a dispensationalist. Uh, I, I guess the alternative would be a, um, to read the book covenantally. Uh, there's a series of covenants and the covenant with Israel was um, accomplished or fulfilled through Jesus. And now um, is, uh, Israel the promises given to Israel are now fulfilled in the church, not in modern day Israel. That's just the way I read the Bible. I think that's the majority reading in church history. Give us the hope and the way forward in terms of appreciating and loving what is good and what is what America is aspiring to do um, and, 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 and how to appreciate that. That means having gratitude for America, for what we stand for, for who we are. And that means the American creed, of course, the Constitution, the Declaration, the ideals we strive for. I also think it's not just the creed. I also think it's our history. I think it's actually pretty important for us as Americans to know something of American history, especially the story of the creed. Because the creed by itself is maybe a bit bloodless and we've never lived up to it. But it's really exciting to learn how we have gotten better mm. at living up to the creed over the decades, over the centuries. And that's actually a very hopeful story. It's also a very Christian story. It's oftentimes Christians who've been leading the way to help us live up better and better to our creed. Uh, 
it's it's a difficult issue because our story has some really bad parts to it, some really big sins uh, nationally and as Christians and, and in our churches. And so I think coming to a greater awareness of that story, maybe including something like a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, some way, some form for us nationally to, to come to grips with our national story, to lament the parts that need lamenting, to express contrition and sorrow, and then also express hope, gratitude, pride, and uh, hopefulness for the future, so that we take ownership of that story and we say, this is my story, it's your story, it's our story together, and we're gonna carry the story forward together. That's what it means to be an American, and we can do that together, recognizing the truths of the past and looking hopefully in the future. How do we navigate trying to um, really promote those morals that that um, we believe are the truth and believe are good for people in a pluralistic society, in a in a, in a republic like that? I think the way to do what you what, what you're asking, the way to pursue justice well, um, and to avoid the dangers of Christian nationalism is to do it in community. And the more diverse your community is, the more you're gonna be safeguarded against these dangers. And I think pastors actually have a specific role here. I think pastors have a role to teach us, not about politics, but about how to live in a social, cultural, political world. Um, Americans are individualistic to our core, uh, and there can be a fault to that we've maybe lost the arts of living well together. If you want the elevator speech or the sermon, it's actually Micah, uh, the book of Micah, which coincidentally I'm preaching through for the next six, seven weeks, right? Uh, Micah's writing to a people who thought of themselves as God's people, to a country that's been built off the backs of slavery, and to a country where the rich keep getting richer and the poor keep getting poorer. So you don't have to do a lot of extrapolation imagination to say like, this might also be speaking to us. A lot of people know the end of Micah in chapter six, when God puts his people on trial. And in there he says, listen, the trees, the mountains, they've all been here forever. They've seen, you've seen how I've been faithful to you, how I've sent you prophets. I've sent you Moses and Miriam and Aaron. I've done all these things. Like, but what do I want from you? It's not your sacrifices. It's not your song and dance, right? Um, and he ends with that famous verse, right? There's a reason why Micah 6, 8 has been, you know, probably the only verse most people know in Micah. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to do justice as God is just. We must love the way God loves, and we must walk in peace with each other. We must also realize that the blood that flow on Calvary's tree matters more than the blood that flows in our veins, right? We must realize that our, our world and our culture and our country is going to call us to individualism, but our faith is not individual. I find that we have a lot more in common than what everyone is speaking about. And sometimes as a Christ follower, I think that frustrates me more than anything because we all want to raise great children. You know, do I, I don't want to push my views off on you, but I want that same respect given back to me. And I think that is the problem that we as some of us Christ followers are having is that it's the moral decay is what we see is because we feel like everything we watch and everything that's out there is pushing such a way that it's going against our, that it's making us feel like we can't even have our stance. It's one thing to say, oh, well, let's celebrate our differences. But when we get to the point as Christ followers, that so they don't want to celebrate our differences. It has to be both ways. So I think this message, as much as us Christians and Christ followers are taking it on for ourselves, in which I think we need to, I think that there is people out there who are preaching it, they're teaching it, they're talking it, but they don't live it. They don't show us the same tolerance that they are asking us to have. I think the church, I think it needs to be standing its ground and keeping its values. I think people are so afraid. If we really be honest, you've got churches who are afraid of losing their 501c3s. I mean, let's. there's so much to this conversation that we could go into. I always go, I don't know what I don't know. I know what I may have heard. I know what I you know, grew up with. I know what I've been told, but that doesn't always necessarily mean that it was accurate. 
It means that it was familiar. It means that it was comfortable. Now some of it is correct. I have, you know, I don't throw everything out at the, in the meantime, mm -hmm. but I have learned that I have to come at with everything humbly and, and investigate it right. and pray about it and mm -hmm. spend time with God about it. And where should I be? We've talked about that before. Where should I be in the midst of any situation, any issue? Where where am yeah. I supposed to be to do this justice and, and actually bring together uh, the country, bring together your own, your individual communities and, and, and show mm -hmm. God's justice and mercy or uh, however the situation may land. I will say that um, I, I, the one thing I, I, I will differ on is I just, I pray that we operate out of a joy and a witness that we want people to see how awesome this is and not out of a fear of what may come. I don't want to operate or don't want the church to make us decisions out of fear, but out of faith to know that God is awesome and God is amazing. And we want to share this with you and we want you to share in this. Do you think but, it's okay then to stand up for what you believe? Like, tell me, tell me your thoughts on that. Oh, I, How I, do you do that? I do. Because that's interesting uh, what you said. I love no, that. No, 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 I do. I really do. And when you are confronting issues, doesn't mean you can't confront an, can't, can't confront an issue and can't yes. have a viewpoint. Mm -hmm. But you know that you must lead with love and you Amen. must live with the witness of Jesus Christ because mm -hmm. uh, you not only will you not get much done in a political arena, mm -hmm. you are certainly not going to get much done in a kingdom building arena. Um, and that's yeah. why we're here. And now let's turn to the fullness of prayer. Most of my marriage, I've been married now for 18 years. My wife and I have tried to uh, rise together or or within an, within an hour or so, and uh, and pray together to start the day that way. We did that for years and years. Um, it's been a little bit harder as the kids have come along and the kids get older. Uh, we just need our sleep. Uh, but starting the day that way in prayer with my wife, we will share about what our day is going to look like, what's burdening our hearts and our minds, and uh, pray for each other that way. Earlier in my life, I also uh, would use a prayer book. I, I'm Baptist, and so there's not a lot of structured liturgy or structured prayers in that tradition, but I did find an enjoyment and a value in using a prayer book. For a while, I had an Eastern Orthodox prayer book, uh, and I've looked at St. Augustine's prayer book as well. And those have been helpful in a way, uh, complementing, um, again, the tradition I come from, where you don't use scripted prayers very much. I have enjoyed uh, maybe balancing by, by looking at prayer books from other more structured liturgies. So again, it's changed throughout my life in different seasons. Um, and I think that's a blessing of the many Christian traditions that we have. Can you tell us uh, how to get the book? And I'll put that in too. How to get the book and where to, if they, how to follow you and your work and what you're doing too. You can get the book on Amazon. Uh, you can also get it directly from the publisher on InterVarsity's website. Uh, I, it's uh, published through InterVarsity IVP Academic, uh, so you can find it on their website as well. You can um, follow me. Uh, I do have a website, pauldavidmiller.com, uh, but I'm also on Twitter, sort of. I'm there as Paul D. Miller 2 And with that, I think we've talked enough. But I hope you've enjoyed it and we've learned a lot today. We'll see you next time for another episode and more conversations on The Full Life.